Between the years of 1826 and 1829, the black population in Cincinnati grew from 700 to 2,258 people. This, of course, caused a buildup of fear in the white population, and in the three short years leading up to the riot, that fear turned to violence. There was knowledge that most of the aggression arose from Irish immigrants citing that the black community were taking all of the jobs away from the Irish community. Furthermore, merchants complained that the poor black neighborhoods along the river were making their waterfront shops look bad. To further the tension, artisans in Cincinnati turned away apprenticeships for talented black men and women, refusing to teach them. As the goal was to chase blacks out of the city in June of 1829, white overseers of black neighborhoods began to reinforce the black laws established in 1807, which stated that all blacks must pay a $500 surety bond to secure their good behavior. They must also prove they were not slaves and had to agree that they would never marry a white citizen or own guns, along with other various white privileges that were not allowed for any African-American citizen. That June, African-Americans were told they had a mere 30 days to pay the $500, which is roughly $12,000 in today's money, or they would be expelled not only from the city, but also from the state. At the same time, there came a threat of prosecution to any white person or family helping any black citizen during this time, and that included loaning the money. Not happy with the lack of exodus from the black community, the American Colonization Society tried to push harder punishments for the break of any of the 1807 black laws and tried to encourage immigration out of the United States entirely by offering, yet again, to send them back to Africa. However, at this time in African American history, most black families were indigenous to the United States and no longer had ties to Africa. Tensions came to a head on August 15th through the 22nd, as mobs of 200 to 300 ethnic whites, mostly Irishmen, attacked the black neighborhoods of the First Ward, trying to use violence to push blacks out of the city. The government of Cincinnati did little to help protect the black community until August 24th, at which point Mayor Jacob Burnett dismissed charges against 10 blacks that had been arrested and imposed fines on the merely eight of the 200 to 300 whites that attacked the ward. In the end, 1,100 to 1,500 people of color decided to leave Cincinnati altogether most seeking and being granted asylum in Canada. However, those native black Americans who remained and those that migrated to stand with them in solidarity were attacked two more times after 1829, in 1836, and again in 1841. Fortunately, this time, they had strengthened many of their rights and positions in the city and were able to fight back. It was said by John Malvin and James C. Brown on why they immigrated to Canada that they desired to exercise their civil rights and live free from the trammels of social and unequal laws. An estimated 460 to 2,000 blacks immigrated to Canada, most settling in existing towns. However, numerous families got together and bought land to form the black community named the Wilberforce Colony in Ontario. Unfortunately, the colony grew too quickly, causing internal disputes, lack of funds, and the draw of urban jobs, leaving the colony, which was created to give blacks the right to have their own laws and government, to exist for fewer than 20 years. In 1836, tensions continued to rise in Cincinnati, and when a New York abolitionist named James G. Burney started the Cincinnati Weekly and Abolitionist newspaper, whites in the city went on the attack, targeting blacks and any white citizens that supported them. The newspaper called to task slaveholders across the Ohio River in Kentucky, which angered local businessmen who were losing deals with southern states due to the editorial attacks. A riot broke out in April and buildings were burned, causing the death of several black citizens and wasn't stopped until the government declared martial law. In July, Bernie's printing press was destroyed twice, along with more damage to black-held properties. And in 1841, a mob of white men met in the 5th Street Market and marched on what was called Little Africa or Bucktown. The residents of Bucktown knew they were coming and they were armed and ready. Yet the whites had secured a cannon, marched it down 6th Street, faced it towards Bucktown, and fired. Many lives were lost. Martial law was declared yet again, only this time. Three hundred black men were arrested, and while they were in custody, 
Their homes were attacked and destroyed. There is no record of any white man being held accountable or prosecuted for this violence. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope that this channel will teach you things that were whitewashed out of our history lessons or taken out altogether for some reason or another. We should not let our lack of teaching destroy our yearn for knowledge. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you.